Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video, laying out for you another top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today, we want to assess 10 ways to help new believers. Our Lord began with raw disciples and, three years later, He sent them out as disciple makers. That's the master plan. As Paul put it in 2 Timothy 2.2, the things you have learned, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Here are some practical suggestions to help new believers start well and keep going. Our first one is to convince them you like having them around. That may not seem to be an important thing, but it really is crucial. We read about the Lord Jesus, that he selected 12 men that they might be with him and that he might send them forth. He actually convinced these men that he liked having them around. And if they feel at home with you, they'll show up more often. And that's what we need, lots of time engaging in life. And this moves into number two, live life with them. I think one of the unfortunate models for discipleship is this idea, you come to my house or we meet somewhere and we have a formal teaching time and that's all you see of me. Well, the fact is that the Lord Jesus lived life with his disciples and they were with him, whether working or worshiping, serving, singing, planning, praying, physical food and spiritual food, your family and God's family. Jesus had them at weddings and funerals, you name it, whatever life entailed, they were together in it. And that's what people need to see. Not just what does a Christian think about certain passages of scripture, but how does a Christian live? How do you treat your dog? How do you drive your car? How do you interact with people? Because that's what Christianity is. It's not just a theory, it's a lifestyle. Our third suggestion is to make friends of their unsaved relatives in non-threatening settings. Wow, this is such an important thing. Very often what happens is a person gets saved and we pull them out of their environment to protect them from negative influences and then we ostracize them. They become so isolated and they live their whole life separated from their family and friends. Instead of realizing that this person is a bridge to many other people who need the Lord. And those people, they might just think I'm a religious goody two-shoe, but what they see in this person is the before and after. They knew this person when they were lost and they've seen them get saved. So they are exhibit A for us to share the gospel with these other people. The problem is when we do this and isolate them, their friends and relatives think that they've been stolen by a cult. They've gone and joined some lunatic cult. And so what we need to do is befriend these people in a setting where they don't feel that they're open season, that we're hunting for them, that we just want to be friends. And maybe it's a barbecue, something where they can see us again in real life settings, ordinary people, loving our wives, loving our kids, living life so that they can feel at home with us before we introduce to them the gospel. If they bring up the gospel, absolutely, let's do it. But let's make them feel at home and realize we're ordinary people too and that their loved one has not been sucked into a cult, that we're actually serious Orthodox Christians. Number four is to go slow with them at first. I love the words of Jacob when he talks about his brother Esau says, why don't you travel with me? And he says, look, I've got some little lambs and I'm not going to force them. I'm not going to drive them. So I want to take it easy. A good shepherd of sheep understands that little lambs can't move at the same speed of older sheep and to not press them because we can discourage them if we push them too far too fast. So small, doable, encouraging steps in the right direction don't overwhelm them, don't dishearten them by giving them too much too fast. And this moves perfectly into number five, 
one lesson at a time. Again, we may be able to move in and out of scripture, connecting various sections. Don't presume anything. Don't presume they know who Moses is. Don't presume they know what justification is. So it's a good idea to maybe take a sheet of paper down the left side, have maybe four or five passages that teach this particular truth, and have one subject. And maybe that subject is salvation. Never presume that people understand salvation. Assurance, eternal security, baptism, church fellowship, the Holy Spirit, the Lordship of Christ, the will of God, witnessing, etc. And so if you have four or five sections of scripture that teach that idea in the Bible, leave space on the right side of the page so that they can write down their observations as you study those passages together. Encourage them to take one or two of these passages and memorize them so that if the subject of witnessing comes up or assurance or eternal security, a passage will fly to their brain and they will be equipped to think about that. So simply giving them one thing at a time. It's like taking a baby immediately from drinking milk to a T-bone steak. No, we have small steps, we have stages in which we grind up most of the food for them. Give them a taste of it and so move them on. That's how we ought to teach them the Word of God. And I think how the Spirit does the same thing with me where he doesn't <laughs> flood all the things I need to work on at once, but he gives me that next step, and then from there, the step after that. Number six, keep your prayers with the new believer short and to the point in plain English. If we want to model something for a young believer, we shouldn't be putting them in an awkward situation where they feel totally unconnected, unrelated to what we're doing. You see those kinds of prayers in the Bible. The Lord Jesus had short prayers. When he was working with his disciples, he encouraged that. He encouraged them to have real communications with God. And so when we're modeling prayer for them, if we're going through Old Testament typology and traveling around the world, it overwhelms them again. And so to model prayers just as we would with little children. We have little prayers they can learn and then they grow in their knowledge. And so we should do in our modeling prayers for young, young believers. Number seven is to make sure they have a good Bible. Sometimes they've been given a paperback edition, a poor print, hard to read. It's a good investment to give them a good Bible. I'll never forget meeting a lady and she was so dignified and she looked like a real blue blood and I asked her her story and she said well I grew myself up my father was a drunkard my mother went to bed to escape and nobody looked after me and I was just a street urchin and one day this beautiful lady stopped me on the street and said how would you like to come to a place where you'll be loved every week and that convinced me it was a Sunday school class and the first Sunday she noticed I didn't have a Bible and instead of just getting me one, she made an event out of it. And she said, could I buy you a Bible? And so after school the next day, she took me to the Bible bookstore and she bought me a Bible with a leather cover. She said that was the turning point of my life. I thought this person thinks I'm gonna stick around. Otherwise she wouldn't pay so much for this Bible. And I never forgot that. Investing in young believers and letting them know you take them seriously and you give them a nice Bible, and then, of course, show them how to use it. Simply taking the Bible and showing them the division between the Old and New Testament and say, like, this is Christmas, this is Jesus coming into the world. Everything before that is before Jesus. Everything after that is after Jesus. And let's go to the table of contents and see that we can find any book in the Bible. Notice that there are four Johns, one letter by John, a gospel, and three epistles, and then show them how to find the chapter and verse so that now they can find their way around the Bible. Don't presume that they know how to do this. One man told me it took him three days to find John 3.16. He saw it at a golf tournament and wondered what it was, and somebody said it was in the Bible. He said, did you know there are four Johns in the Bible? 
<laughs> and so don't presume this. Help them find their way around the Bible. And once they can find a reference, then they relax. Good. And our number eight way to help a new believer is to encourage openness and honesty. One of the great things about the Christian life is you don't have to pretend anything. The first thing the Lord wants us to do is to be honest with Him. And when we have that intimacy, of course, confidentiality too, they need to be free to express their struggles and their burdens and not to assume, well, I can't believe you would do such a thing or think such a thing. The Apostle Paul tells us, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Don't presume that you're above the temptation that they're struggling with at the present time. Maybe they need some help. Covenant Eyes software, which gives a security system so that if they look at a certain site, if they have a problem with pornography, they look at a certain site, it flags it on your computer. And it's just another way to hold their hand and help them through some of the difficulties that they're facing as they struggle with temptation. So we need to have them in our homes, have them available maybe during family gatherings. It may be that if they go back to their family right away for holidays, they may be tempted with alcohol or whatever it might be. So pray them through those things, offer them ways of escape. I knew one local church and they planned their midweek prayer meeting on Friday night because all of the people who had been saved recently, that was their party night. And so they replaced it with a prayer time and a time of fellowship for the Christians. So let's think about where they're at. Don't always treat them from where you're at, but try to get in their shoes and understand how best to help. Number nine is to include them right away in opportunities for good works. Yes, it gives them a sense of accomplishment, of involvement, of of significance in the work of God. Treat them seriously. Introduce them to your friends. Let them tell their testimony. Give them opportunities to minister to people at the level where they're at. Don't lift up, the scripture says, don't lift up a novice into a high place, but give them opportunities to begin to serve. And then finally, number 10, celebrate every small victory. I think this is important. Don't wait until they're on the platform preaching. Look at the little improvements, cleaning themselves up, singing up, putting a little money into the offering, whatever it might be, any little thing at all. Find ways to keep encouraged. We know that we are stimulated much more by encouragement than we are by discouragement. And so don't put them down all the time. Even though there may be lots to criticize and lots to correct, try to encourage them positively and help them to memorize a few good verses on every topic so that they feel competent. And then ask them what they're discovering and rejoice with them in their discoveries, even though you may have discovered it a long time ago. And pray together and appreciate their prayers and say amen to them. Let me just, in closing, read a verse here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul talks about how he treated the new believers. And in verse 7 he says, We were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. But then down in verse 11 he says, As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. And so both of these are true, that we need to be comforting and cherishing as a mother would treat them, but we also need to be instructing them and charging them, exhorting them as a father would. And if we have that nice balance of grace and truth, of speaking the truth but doing it in love, patting them on the back and sometimes a little bit lower, we'll have that nice balance, they'll know we care about them, and they'll respond happily to the, the ministry of discipleship. <laughs>